Yes, hello everyone and welcome. We're going to start in just three and a half minutes. We have something very exciting tonight. We've mainly talked about raptors and other birds, but never really about vultures. And tonight we have the pleasure of having Dr. Jose Tavares, who lives in Turkey, originally from Portugal, uh, to talk about the subject about vulture conservation and it's uh, the Vulture Con Conservation Foundation. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Zasse Foto, Christian Zasse. I run this uh, uh, Conservation of Wildlife channel. Uh, we have broadcasts every Friday, and you're very welcome to join with lots of questions. It's all about you communicating uh, with our guest. So it's very exciting, and um, I'll go back on silent and talk to you very soon in just over two minutes. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. I'm just going to put the clock away here. One second. There we go. Now we're correct. Well, welcome to another show, one exciting show. This time it's all about vultures. It um, was in November the 2nd. And first of all, happy birthday to Nicole. Uh, so um, yeah, Nicole's birthday. So hi, say hi to her. And uh, very nice that she got an incredible guest tonight. Um, we're going all the way to Ankara and Turkey. If you know what the local time in Turkey is at the moment, you'll be surprised. It's just after 3 a.m. So it's quite incredible that our guest at probably the most tired time you can imagine has volunteered to join us. And it's not just anybody. It's a very, very highly educated ornithologist uh, originally from Portugal. And I will introduce him to you in a moment. So it's also very exciting because we have the uh, eagle season coming up. Uh, November is very exciting. I think um, Kit's also coming up and uh, Jamie's coming up. They're cousins. They're coming up again. And I just want to welcome everybody else. I see Jackie there. Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Susan North. Uh, Blue 24. I'm just going to go through the list quickly, make sure I don't forget anyone. Bill Kitchen. Camroid the Asteroid Dragon. Jackie Porter. Uh, 
Yes, Margaret, that's on that's on YouTube and many others. Then we are also live on Periscope at the moment. So I'm looking at the other screen of Periscope. And of course, we're also live on Facebook. Absolutely fantastic. OK, so what you see behind there, um, I think Osprey Mama asked me last time what that is that you see behind me. And that was from this beautiful uh, Congress that we had here, the um, International Ornith Ornithological Congress that we had in Vancouver. And you can see these are artists for conservation, something that we really support. And they made these beautiful paintings. Some of them look so real, they're like photos. And they're just so many beautiful uh, it's a long, long wall. It just goes on and on and on. And so I've, I like this so much that I'm always going to use it as my background. And they are actually, I've, I even found some vultures on here. I'm just going to go on and just show you quickly. Ah, we had, I've seen them one second. Oh, that's not sharp. Where, where is it? No, it's funny, huh? Uh, there we are. That should... Yes, and I saw some other ones too. Anyway, I'm going to switch live now. And so welcome, Dr. Jose Tavares. One second, I'm going to put the title. So, so Jose, thank you so much for joining in at this crazy time. It's uh, just after 3 a.m. It's, it's really amazing, and we're very glad to have you here. So how are you? Are you still awake? Or are you drinking some wine? <laughs> Thank you. Now everything uh, everything is fine. I just had uh, a coffee and uh, and I'm here. I'm I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and uh, I'm I'm awake and I hope that I stay awake during the program. Uh, we'll keep you awake. Don't you worry. Uh, that's also why I want to say to all the viewers, thank you very much. It doesn't matter whether you're on Periscope, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, we're going to catch your questions and uh, please forward your questions because it's going to be very interesting. So it's all about vultures. It's, it's something that we usually grow up and say, oh my goodness, a vulture, how ugly. But it turns out to be completely different. I mean, vultures are very interesting creatures. So um, Jose, you have such an interesting background. You speak several languages. You speak five languages. You, you've, I think you're originally Portuguese. You've been to Spain, uh, also Cyprus, and Greece, and Turkey. I mean, what, what a variety. How come you've got such an interesting, first of all, what, what made your life so interesting? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I'm an ornithologist. I'm a biologist and I specialized in ornithology. Ornithology is the study uh, of, of birds. I did, uh, I did my university uh, uh, in, in Portugal. I did all my uh, you know, um, school in, in Portugal, including the university. Uh, and then um, I went on to do my PhD in the UK. At, at that time, I did my PhD on bird song, so nothing related with, with vultures, and I studied bird song, uh, the song of small birds, for, for a number of years. And after finishing my PhD in the UK, uh, I started to work for uh, the largest nature conservation organization uh, in Europe and one of the largest in the world, uh, an organization called the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Um, and for a number of years, uh, I have uh, worked on um, bird conservation projects, um, lots of different species, lots of different groups. And about uh, four years ago, um, the Vulture Conservation Foundation, a small uh, NGO, a small foundation, um, uh, asked me if uh, uh, I would like to um, uh, help them develop uh, their, their their organization, their portfolio of projects, their conservation program, and I took um, I took that challenge. Um, until then, uh, uh, I mm, I didn't really know much about vultures. I had worked in one or two projects on vultures before, but I was not by any means an expert. And about four years ago, as I, as I said, I, I started to work for the Vulture Conservation Foundation. Um, which is a, a foundation uh, specialized in the conservation of vultures, in particular European and Asian vultures, and uh, has been working on, on it ever since, and it has been a hell of a ride. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been extremely exciting. We have increased a lot our portfolio of projects. We've increased a lot our, our conservation program um, uh, and uh, I've learned immensely in the, in, in the last four years and I'm extremely motivated to continue 
to work uh, for, for vultures and as our logo and uh, says all together for vultures yeah what i found interesting is i think this is the vulture conservation foundation is based in switzerland as far as i understand and you are working you are actually the director of the vulture Con uh, conservation foundation uh but you're based in turkey so how does all that work Correct. So the the Vulture Conservation Foundation uh, is based in in Switzerland. We've got a very small office in in Switzerland where there is actually only one of the staff members working there. Why Switzerland? Because our origins uh, uh, relate to one project in the Alps uh, and therefore to uh, to Switzerland. Um, we we started really um, uh, as an organization that intended to uh, reintroduce the birded vulture, which is uh, you, you see it in the screen is is that guy in the middle with with an orange uh, with an orange neck um, and uh, uh, with with a little beard in uh, in uh, um, uh, on the beak. It's also sometimes called the lammergeier. Um, but we so so uh, 40 years ago, uh, a bunch of people decided to reintroduce that species to the Alps. The species had disappeared from most of Europe, and it uh, survived only in the Pyrenees and on uh, two uh, small island populations uh, in Crete in Greece and Corsica in France. Uh, it's a mountain bird. It's a bird that that lives in in mountains. Um, and so about 40 years ago, a group of people started to dream about the possibility of uh, returning it or introducing it to, to nature. Um, uh, because it is such a rare species, uh, you, there is no way of uh, going and getting it from one place and bringing it to another one. The only way to reintroduce such a, ra a rare species in, into nature is to actually do captive breeding um, and then releasing the young that are captive bred. So uh, about 40 years ago, what they've done is they, they've actually got some funding from a Frankfurt Zoological Society, a German organization, and they actually bought the 40 or so um, captive birded vultures that existed uh, in the world that were mostly located in Europe. And with that pool of birds, they've created some captive breeding centers um, and uh, uh, they started to breed them in captivity and then release them into the wild. Um, uh, that project started about 30 years ago. It was our first project and hence the location in Switzerland because the whole project was based in the, reintrodu the, reintrodu the reintroduction of these species into the Alps. Um, after this, more recently, the, the foundation uh, decided to expand its remit um, to cover the other species of European vultures and to do vulture conservation projects across Europe, across the Middle East uh, uh, and even into, into Asia. So therefore, um, uh, it, uh, it, it increased the, the number of staff, it increased the, uh, the, 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 the program. We now have got nine staff uh, distributed all across Europe. Um, including me here in Turkey. The, the guy that you see there on the screen is indeed uh, the birded vulture or lammergeier. That's an adult bird. It's a picture of an adult bird. The, the young ones are slightly, um, slightly different. They are more brown. But then after three or four years, they develop into that beautiful color. It's a, it's a fantastically beautiful bird. You can see why it is called the birded vulture, because it has got this uh, you know, small beard uh, just under the neck, the beak. It has got this fantastic um, a uh, red eye ring uh, around around the eye. Now, the 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 unique thing about this species um, is that it um, it eats bones. Uh, its diet is specialized on bones, and an adult bird like the one that you have in the picture. Um, uh, can uh, has got uh, can can eat uh, in its diet about eighty percent of its diet is composed of bones, including dried bones. In fact, um, in several languages, this species is called the bone eater or the bone breaker. It can eat bones rather large, bones thirty or forty centimeters large. 
Um, uh, but sometimes uh, it finds uh, bones of animals uh, that are even larger than that. You can imagine that the femur, the leg bone of a cow or of a, um, a wild goat might be a, a actually a little bit bigger than 30 or 40 meters. So what this um, birded vulture or lammergeier does is it picks up those bones, it flies uh, uh, with them over a slope full of rocks and scree and drops the bone um, in, into the rocks so that the bone breaks uh, and then it can eat the the, the pieces uh, of, of 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 the broken bone. Uh, so in many languages, um, the this species is actually call, uh, called the bone breaker. That's the case in Spanish. It's called quebranta huesos. Um, it's also um, the, the case in Catalan. Uh, in some uh, French dialects, it's called uh, uh, also casseur d'eau. Uh, so the bone breaker, and it's absolutely phenomenal. It's a species of vulture that specializes in eating bones. It's unique in the world. Um, uh, it was once upon a time almost almost extinct in Europe. We have reintroduced it into the Alps, and now we are introducing it into many other sites in um, uh, and mountains uh, in in Europe today. Um, there, there are more than 50 pairs, 50 couples of these species uh, already breeding in the Alps. And this is from zero um, 40 years ago. Um, uh, the species has increased through our reintroduction efforts. And this is uh, really one of our main activities and expertise. We breed these species in captivity and then reintroduce uh, some uh, of the chicks that are produced in captivity into, um, into the mountains, into, into nature. At the moment, um, we have about um, 167 birded vultures in captivity. These are kept in some specialized captive breeding centers, which are managed by us, uh, but sometimes also uh, distributed uh, in zoos um, uh, across uh, across Europe, um, uh, and uh, uh, we manage this captive stock for uh, conservation. Uh, we release as many young as we can um, in, in in nature. They they are a very long lived bird. They can live uh, up to forty or fifty years. Um, and uh, they only breed when they are 10 years old. So as you can imagine, any project with these species is extremely uh, long. We are talking about a conservation project that takes 20, 30, 40 or 50 years, not something that can be sorted uh, with, with, with only a, a few years. Because every bird that we release into the wild will only start breeding 10 years later and it has to survive during those 10 years so we need to work on the the threats that affect the the, the species we have to make sure that they are minimized um, uh, and and therefore this effort is uh, slow um, and extreme long term but uh, the, 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 the fact is that we've actually managed uh, ex very good results, huge successes. We reintroduced it to the Alps. We've also reintroduced it to Andalusia, a region in southern Spain where they had disappeared and where the, they are now breeding uh, again through, uh, due to our reintroduction efforts. Um, and we are uh, uh, doing the same in some other mountain ranges where no doubt they will start to breed uh, quite soon. Well, Jose, that is an incredible uh, detailed answer. Thank you so much. You actually have a very nice presentation with some slides. So I suggest we go through them. And uh, could you just answer a quick question? I'm sure we're going to get many questions uh, uh, as uh, as we progress. But uh, it is often known that or, or when you open literature, it says that the turkey vulture has the best sense of smell. What is your comment on this? Yes, well, so uh, two things there. Um, first, turkey vulture. Turkey vulture is, is a, a vulture of the new world. 
There are about 23, there are, well, exactly 23 species of vultures worldwide, but they actually belong to two very separate families. The New World vultures, which are the, the, the vultures of North and South America, which includes the turkey vulture, the black vulture, but also the, the larger condors, and then the Old World vultures of uh, Africa, Asia, and, and Europe. They, uh, they look alike. And, and many people think that they are from the same family. But in fact, they are from two completely unrelated and, sep uh, and separate families. The fact that they look alike is because they have converged into looking alike through a phenomenon that in, in nature is called convergent evolution. Because they explore the same niche, uh, the, the, their bodies... Uh, look a little bit alike. And one feature, for example, that they have, and let me just tell you this, uh, is uh, very often um, uh, vultures in the New World and in the Old World have got the neck without any feathers. That's the case, for example, of uh, one of the vultures there in the picture uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the griffon vulture, but that's also the case of the turkey vulture in the New World or of the, Cali or the California condor. And this is why, and, the, and why is this? Why do, don't they have feathers in the neck? Vultures are scavengers. They eat dead meat. Uh, they usually do not kill prey. They eat dead bodies, dead animals that they find in the field. These dead bodies uh, very often are uh, relatively rotten. And uh, they have to uh, eat uh, uh, meat which is decomposing or very bloody. Uh, uh, very often full of flies, full of bacteria, and so on. Um, uh, vultures very often have to put their heads into the, the corpses of rotten animals. Um, and if they had lots of feathers in the neck, uh, uh, th these feathers would very soon be full of blood and um, organic juices, and then that could actually uh, um, uh, bring, uh, accumulate and bring some disease. So in order to prevent this, many vulture species, not all, but many vulture species, uh, have lost the feathers on the neck so that they can indeed uh, scavenge and eat the inside of corpses um, and keep their uh, necks relatively clean um, uh, without the, the, the problems of, uh, you know, of, of these juices, the blood, and, and so on. Uh, on your question, um, uh, actually, again, turkey vultures um, are unique in the vulture guild. Most vultures do not have any sense of smell, uh, and they uh, find food uh, through vision. There's a perception that all vultures find dead bodies because they, say, they smell the rotten, the rotten body. Uh, that's not true except for the turkey vulture, which indeed is again a special case within vultures because they do have got a rather developed sense of smell. All the other uh, uh, vultures Old world vultures, new world vultures. So I'm talking about the Californian condors, even the American black vulture, and all the vultures that you see in the picture do not have a, a developed sense of smell. They find food by visual clues. They fly very high um, uh, over the landscape. Um, uh, and whenever they see some um, uh, other bird species, some other scavengers going down, they go and investigate because this could be a, a potential um, uh, dead animal. And when a couple of these vultures go down, all the others that might be several hundred meters or even kilometers away uh, then follow. They've got an incredible sense of, of, uh, uh, of sight uh, and, and they find food mostly uh, through visual clues. Turkey vulture is special. Indeed, you are right. He has got a, a, um, a very good sense of smell, but it is unique in the vulture world. Very, very good answer. Thank you so much. You know, you've got this beautiful presentation. So what I suggest, Jose, if it's okay with you, let's go through it. And I already see four questions coming in. So we'll take one or two slides and then I'll put in a question and so on. Are you okay with that? Perfect. Okay, let's go ahead. So this is the first so, rather gruesome picture. What are we seeing here? 
Yes, so this this is a picture taken um, taken uh, about forty or fifty years ago in India, uh, and uh, very often I, um, I I say that uh, um, you know if if you if you had asked me forty years ago. Uh, where can I see um, uh, thousands or hundreds of vultures feeding at the same time? I would point. I would say that you should go to India, to the Indian subcontinent. This was the typical image of an Indian town 40 years ago. This species there is called the African white-backed Indian. Was probably one the the the, the most common uh, vulture and bird of prey in the world. Tens of millions lived in Indian towns, and they would uh, scavenge, uh, eat garbage, uh, dead animals, dead cows uh, in Indian towns. What you see here is some buildings, you see um, uh, some trucks that probably brought garbage, and you see this mass of, of India, Indian vultures eating these organic uh, materials. One um, message already, Vultures in general are nature's cleaning crew. Uh, they are the equivalent of uh, the people that clean our streets, take out our garbage. They clean the carcasses and the dead animals from our countryside. And this is really their value uh, and their importance. They are extremely important because without them, uh, uh, dead animals can accumulate. But this picture, you don't see it any longer in India because uh, all these vultures have died out. There was a decline of 99% in uh, vultures in Asia, and in particular in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, because of a veterinary uh, product called diclofenac that was given to cattle. It's an anti-inflammatory drug that was given to cattle uh, as, a, as a veterinary drug, and that uh, is lethal uh, extremely toxic to vultures. So in Asia, it's not yet, it's not possible to see images like this any longer. Vultures there are extremely rare and threaten with extinction. So if we pass to the next slide. Right, by the way, I saw, I saw some some comments coming in here from uh, Periscope. Oh, I thought they were dead. You know, honestly, Jose, that was my first impression too. Uh, no, I, I Yes, I know. They, this is so clear because we've never seen anything like this. That's why. Okay. They are eating. They're they are eating, in a feeding yes. frenzy, yes. eating all, you know, one, uh, you know, above the others. So, I mean, you know, 40 years ago, if you wanted to see lots of vultures, you know, you would go to India. Not any longer. If you ask the same question to me 30 years ago or even 20 years ago, I would say go to Africa, where this picture uh, that you have now in the screen was shot. Um, this is a, a typical, uh, was a typical picture, not not the one not the one that you see, the, the the second one. This is a typical picture of of the African savanna. You see there four or two or three species of vultures uh, over a carcass. As you know, uh, Africa still retains quite a lot of the, the the natural parks and the biodiversity. You've got the large predators, you've got large ungulates, the zebras, the wilder beasts, the impalas. So um, uh, there is a lot, uh, or there was a lot, uh, uh, there is a lot still uh, of, of food available to vultures. And in, indeed, about 30 years ago, you'd go to any national park, the Serengeti, the Masai Mara, uh, and you'd see pictures like this. Unfortunately, uh, this picture is now extremely rare. African vultures are uh, threatened with extinction. They, they, they have gone through what we call a, a, an extinction crisis. And why? Mostly because of a phenomenon which is called poaching. Uh, so the illegal killing of some African wildlife, notably for ivory. So people, as you are probably aware, have been killing illegally elephants and rhinoceros for their ivory and you can ask the question so why why are vultures threatened and related to that one very simple explanation uh, vultures eat dead meat so when poachers killed and kill an elephant uh, the vultures detect the elephant uh, detect that the elephant is dead and they start to come down uh, uh, when the people kill an elephant to extract the tusks, 
that is quite a difficult job. They usually uh, take a couple of hours to extract the ivory tusks from the elephant, even using, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, saw, um, uh, electrical saws and, 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 uh, and, and so on. And during that time, the vultures start to circle above the dead elephant as they do above a carcass. Well, wildlife enforcement agencies started to uh, cue in on these vultures to detect potential cases of uh, illegal killing of elephants, of poaching of elephants. And, uh, and the poachers themselves started to find out that they were being found and arrested uh, due to the vultures. So what they are now doing is they are poisoning these vultures in large quantities. Whenever they kill a, an elephant, they cut some, some meat from the elephant, they move a few hundred meters away, they lace that meat with, um, with a very potent poison to kill the vultures that are coming down so that they do not signal to the wildlife um, enforcement agents the, the 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 killing of an elephant this phenomenon is called sentinel poisoning and has uh, killed thousands and thousands of vultures across africa to the point that these vultures uh, this species and this image is extremely rare in africa oh my goodness because you, you know when you said that i grew i grew up in south africa and i was just thinking at that time at least in the uh, uh yeah, that was in the late 70s. I, I think vultures were quite common. So what you're talking about, the sentinel uh, uh, killing or, 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 or so, uh, poisoning, sorry, sentinel poisoning. poisoning. That, yeah, poisoning must, must be something that has happened, especially maybe in the last one or two decades, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's in the last two decades, mm -hmm. coincides with the increase of poaching of elephants and, and rhino. Um, and you are absolutely right. 20, 30 years ago, this scene would be very common in places like, for example, the Kruger in South Africa. It is now quite rare. So if you pass to the next slide. Yes, sure. I'm going to throw a good question at you in the meantime. So I'm going to start now. Jackie Porter is asking, why only bone compared to many other vulture diets? So she's referring obvi obviously to, your, to, you know, to, the, um, to the first uh, vulture. Yeah, very good question. Um, why only bone? Well, um, in, in fact, uh, bone because it is an available resource that you know no other animal is eating. Nature is wonderful at dividing the resources um, among the the, the 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 species so that they take maximum uh, uh, um, return from 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 resource. if all, all birds or of all animals ate the same thing there would be a lot of competition um, and therefore it makes sense that they specialize in different parts of an animal so in fact um, for example the four european vulture species tell this uh, this uh, uh, the, 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 tell a perfect story uh, or about about precisely uh, precisely this the, the four species of european vultures are specialized in slightly different parts of an animal you have got the griffon vulture which is usually the first that arrive to a carcass to a dead animal which has got the most powerful beak and which is actually capable of um, uh, uh, perforating uh, the, the, the tough skin of a dead animal and start eating the, the viscera and, and the animal uh, from, from the inside. And this species is also the species that actually lost the feathers on the neck precisely because it puts its head inside the, the animal. The second species that comes is the Cinereus vulture that likes to eat um, the, the the you know the the tendons some some of the muscles some of the cartilaginous material the third species is the egyptian vulture which is the smaller one and this one eats basically um the the bits and pieces that came come out from the other two larger vultures feeding on the carcass and when all this is finished and everything is eaten, and only the bones remain, there should come the, the birded vulture to eat uh, the bones. So different species have adapted to slightly different um, parts of an animal, so that they all have food, and an animal is completely decomposed. 
um, two things here. Um, if these four species uh, were abundant and living in the same place, the carcass of an animal would be absolutely clean in a couple of hours. I'm talking about the carcass of a cow. Um, so a picture like this, for example, that you are seeing is, 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 a, is a group of griffon vultures in Spain can clean, practically eat the whole carcass uh, of, of a cow in about two hours. You know, in the beginning, you've got a dead cow. Two hours later, you practically only have got the bones and then would the, the birded vulture would arrive and even the bones would be eaten. The second thing I would like to, to say about this is that bones are uh, they they are uh, they don't they don't seem so but they are quite nutritive due to the bone marrow what is inside the bone um, so they birded vultures they 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 ingest the bone uh, then their uh, stomachs which are extremely powerful dissolve the calcium the bone itself and they get the, the the nutrition they require from the bone marrow. And what is special about bones is that they retain the nutritive value for a long time, up to two years. So you can actually have got an old bone, a bone that has been um, exposed to the elements for a year or, or even over a year, and that bone will still retain the nutritive value because the inside of the bone is still there, the, the bone marrow is still there and can be used by a birdie vulture. Well, that's very informative. Should we go to the next slide and I'll, I'll ask the next question then? Yeah, so this slide here is um, is actually a, um, a, a group of griffon vultures eating um, a carcass in, in Spain. And today in the old world, this is the place where you actually can find uh, hundred, hundreds or even thousands of vultures together. So, um, you know, 30 years ago would be India, no longer. 20 years ago would be Africa, no longer. If today you want to see healthy, strong, abundant vulture populations, um, this is in Europe. This is ironic because Europe is not really recognized or known as a continent of vultures. But indeed, this is the case. For old world vultures, Europe has become the reservoir uh, of, of vultures, the only continent where vultures are actually increasing, where we are actually increasing their populations and their distribution area. So if we go if you go to the next slide, um, this is this is in, 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 in indeed the message. Europe as a continent of vultures, um, and you as a continent where uh, vulture conservation best practice exists. We know, because we've done it, uh, we know exactly what needs to be done in order to save vultures, uh, and hence the sentence that is there, which has been borrowed from um, uh, a former uh, American president, yes, we can, yes, we can save vultures, yes, we have been saving vultures in, uh, in, in Europe. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is a very important message because um, in in the rest of the world, um, uh, particularly in Africa and in Asia, but also in some parts of uh, the Americas, um, uh, vultures are declining uh, and are getting extinct. And we need some positive messages. Um, uh, sometimes doom and gloom uh, prevails in, in conservation. We are always complaining, species, this species is disappearing, this species is getting extinct, oh my God, what a disaster. And this is mostly true, but I think it is quite important sometimes to, to, to in order to fight you know, some hopelessness, to have some positive stories. And, and vultures in Europe uh, are a positive story in the sense that in the last few decades, we have increased their population, uh, we have increased their, their distribution range, we can do it, and it is quite important to pass this message to colleagues across the world that if sufficient investment and uh, is put, and if know-how exists, we can revert the decline of biodiversity. Well, that's, thank you. That is an incredibly detailed uh, answer. Uh, I'm going to give you also question number two here from, from Cassie Scott. Are they susceptible to lead in their environment? Because we've had a lot of discussion here on lead poisoning. So that's the question, really. 
Absolutely. Very good question. Thank you for it. Uh, yes, that's one of the threats, one of the many threats affecting vultures. Um, they uh, lead affects vultures as it affects uh, other wildlife, um, including uh, including humans. Um, the lead they get in uh, the environment comes mostly from hunting ammunition. Uh, so the bullets that hunters use um, uh, to, uh, to to kill to kill their game. Uh, quite a lot of the animals that are wounded or uh, or or die um, are sometimes not retrieved and are de- are then eaten by vultures. Or very often, hunters actually uh, take parts of the animal uh, that they uh, kill, uh, leave those in nature, and then um, uh, and and then take take home whatever they want to eat. The problem is that they these have got lead residues, the 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 the, the remnants of the bullets, and this causes uh, lead poisoning. This is extremely important in some species. Californian condors uh, are very well known for being uh, uh, susceptible and very affected by lead to the to them to the point that even today most Californian condors have to be captured, even the ones living in the wild, year after year to be tested for lead. And if they've got high lead contents in their bodies, they are then uh, treated. Um, uh, so lead is a, a, a problem and there is one obvious solution which is um, hunters should use non-lead ammunition, ammunition made of other uh, um, metals, copper, uh, uh, some other alloys and so on, which exist uh, so that uh, we don't poison our environment and our vultures with lead. Yeah, and I just have to throw in, because we had this discussion before, you know, this this is a worldwide problem. Uh, maybe it's just my perception, but I was always surprised that so little is done uh, uh, about this. You're absolutely right. There are other alloys, but uh, um, they, they, they still, still they, I, I see very little success, or am I wrong? Well, um, there has been some progress, and I think sooner or later, lead will also be banned from uh, uh, hunting ammunition. Um, it is a it is a toxic uh, metal for 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 humans and, and wildlife. It has been banned from petrol. It has been banned from paints, um, and the logic and common sense tells us that it should be banned from from ammunition. Uh, in fact. In many countries, including the US, Canada, and in countries in Europe, it has already been banned from um, uh, ammunition that is used in wetlands. Um, so many wetlands uh, or hunters that, that hunt ducks in wetlands cannot legally use uh, lead ammunition. Uh, we are now fighting and lobbying for this to be extended to mountains, the wider, the wider environment. Yes, uh, Entret19 is asking, how many eggs do they lay? Well, I don't know if there's a general uh, generic answer for 23 species of vultures, but maybe you can comment on this. Yeah, so relatively few, like like large raptors, relatively few eggs. Most species may lay um, uh, two eggs. Some species will lay only one, uh, one egg. Um, uh, usually only one young survives. Uh, like is the case with with many raptors. And let me tell you a story about, again, the birded vulture, which is the guy in the middle over there. And they have what is called, um, and I'm sorry for the the, the term, is a bit technical, obligatory canism. This is a phenomenon where uh, one of the chicks, if two chicks uh, uh, hatch from the eggs, one of the chicks kills the other chick. This is uh, observed in many raptor species. Um, for example, it happens sometimes in golden eagles um, uh, and other other species of, of eagles. In those species, it's not uh, obligatory, which means it doesn't happen all the time. If there is enough food, uh, the two chicks will survive. If there is very little food, then the older chick tends to kill when he's, he, he is angry, the younger chick. But in the birded vulture, this is uh, this happens all the time, even when there is, in the years, where there is enough food. Again, this is an evolutionary response to a situation where generally uh, uh, there is relatively uh, little food. So in the case of the birded vulture, they put two eggs, 
uh, if two chicks hatch, the, the older one will kill the younger one and only one chick will survive. So they put relatively few eggs, one or two, and, and usually only one of the chicks survive. Uh, and that's why um, they are longer lived species. Um, and that's why um, if they go extinct or if they go very rare, and um, it's a little bit more difficult to uh, to bring them back um, because they produced so few chicks, um, not like you know other species that breed quite well. And therefore we have to wait quite a few years for them to produce chicks uh, and have good breeding productivity to recover their populations. Okay, very good. Uh, here comes another question from Carrie Miller, and she is asking, wait, wait a second, where was the question? Yes, so both the New World and Old World vultures have super immune systems. That's, that's a great question. So go ahead. Correct. Um, they have evolved um, uh, immune systems and uh, um, digestive systems that can actually cope with uh, rotten meat uh, and would not would what normally would kill you me or any other animal if we ate a portion of uh, um, you know a, a dead cow which has been under the sun for four or five days full of bacteria full of anthrax uh, does not kill vultures so for example vultures are immune to anthrax um, and, and so on uh, funnily enough uh, they've got this incredibly, uh, um, you know, uh, powerful and, and uh, 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 immune system which resists to everything. But then uh, we found out they are extremely susceptible uh, to that veterinary medicine that I described uh, a little a little while ago, the uh, uh, diclofenac, uh, the anti an anti-inflammatory drug. So really, um, you know, um, a bit contradictory and ironic, but it's true, absolutely true. They've got a phenomenal um, digestive system and they can basically eat um, anything rotten. Uh, uh, they will not get sick or they will not get ill. Right. And here's another interesting question from Carrie Miller. Have people changed their use of medicine for cattle so it doesn't have such a devastating secondary kill? That's a very good question. Um, so in India, what happened uh, was, and 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 then I would like to 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 say a few things about the picture in you know in, in the screen. Um, um, but going back to the question, uh, in India, uh, when we realized that uh, the clofenac was killing vultures. Uh, there was actually, um, uh, you know, some some lobbying work being done, and uh, and now a number of countries in India have actually banned the use of that veterinary drug. Uh, there are uh, alternative drugs, um, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, with the same uh, uh, performance that are not toxic to vultures, and, and therefore uh, we advocate uh, farmers and veterinaries to use to use uh, to use those and not um, and not the clofenac the the picture that you have there uh, is actually it's taken in 1913 so over 100 years ago uh, in the italian alps in a valley called the aosta valley which is just near under the mont blanc which is the uh, europe's highest mountain and this is actually the last birded vulture killed in the alps um so the, the that spe the species had disappeared basically with this individual uh, killed in 1913. at the time uh, people thought that birdie vultures because they look like eagles um uh, killed uh, and took lambs um, hence also the the german name for the species uh, lama gaia um, and therefore, there was a very intense direct persecution of eagles in general and of birded vultures because they thought that, be, that these were also uh, uh, eagles. Uh, so after this individual was killed, the, this species uh, has disappeared from the Alps and only returned um, uh, eight years later. In, in the end of the 20th century after reintroduction. And I would just like to point you out about the incredible wingspan of this species. It is about 
three meters. It's got a wingspan of three meters. You can see, you can see there are three people there, um, and how how wide and large this uh, this species is. There are a number of other species of vultures, including, for example, the Californian condor, um, the European cinereus vulture, and so on, that are. Uh, extremely large, uh, very very big, and if you see a vulture close by, you'll be amazed by by its size. Right, that's uh, that's that's quite incredible. Let me go to the next picture, and I'll look up the next question. So go ahead, please. So this- so this is this is really just to illustrate what we do with uh, with with this birded vulture. So uh, for introduction, we we do captive breeding of birded vultures. This includes um, you know uh, quite a lot of of uh, work, including artificial incubation of eggs uh, and so on. And um, uh, and it's through this effort that we produce chicks like the one above, um, being fed by uh, its mother or father. Um, that we then release into the wild uh, in the Alps, in Andalusia, or in other regions in um, in Europe, and therefore bring the species back into nature. Uh, sorry. Yes, and that uh, blends in very well with a question here from Terry Green. Hello, Jose. Inter- interesting subject. Do you use non-releasable vultures in your breeding program? Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, so these days uh, we do not, uh, and for a long time, we do not uh, uh, capture vultures in the wild uh, for, uh, um, for, 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 uh, for releasing. Um, I will then explain the picture that you have in the screen. But going back to the question, uh, we obviously, we are a conservation organization. We are not going to take vultures from the wild and put them in captivity for breeding. So what we use mostly is birds um, that uh, uh, are found injured in the wild uh, are not releasable because their injuries are, are of some sort that uh, they would not survive uh, alone in the wild, broken wings, broken bones, and so on, and use those birds in captivity for uh, for breeding. Um, that and, of course, the stock that already exists in, uh, in, in zoos. I'll go back to that picture. This is a picture in the Alps, and this is a bird being released. Um, I have to tell you that we don't release birds like this usually, in the sense that we release chicks uh, from captive breeding, and we release them through a method called hacking. So we put the chick in an artificial nest somewhere in, uh, in, in nature uh, and allow the chick to develop for a few weeks and then fly alone. And this is the best way to adapt um, a captive bred chick to, um, uh, to nature. The bird in the picture, which is very powerful, um, is a bird that was found injured in the wild. It's a young birded vulture, was found injured in the wild. Uh, it was then uh, rehabilitated in a, re- in a wildlife hospital uh, and was then released. Uh, and because it was already flying and so on, uh, we released it uh, like that. Uh, but this is the type of habitat um, uh, where we are working high mountains in the Alps and elsewhere and where we are bringing these species back. To... I mean, that is such an impressive uh, picture, uh, especially with the, with the surrounding. I mean, did you hike up there? I'm just curious. <laughs> yes, we do. We, we, we do hike up there. In fact, uh, in order to bring um, the chicks uh, up to the, to the platforms where we put them, uh, as I mentioned, through that method called hacking, um, we very often have to hack, uh, you know, several kilometers, uh, sometimes in deep snow, to put them in a platform as close as uh, similar as as to a, a natural nest for them to adapt to the natural environment, and um, and it's always you know a, lo- a logistical challenge and and an operation that requires uh, some planning. Very good. Okay, next question again uh, here from Casey Scott: Do the old world vultures nest on cliffs? 
Yeah, very good question. We've got um, we've got different uh, different uh, um, uh, strategies. Basically, two types of strategies. You've got some species that nest on cliffs, on on on, on rock ledges, like the birded vulture, uh, like the griffon vulture, uh, and but then you also have got some species that nest uh, on trees, like the European cinereus vulture or like the African wooded vulture. So they nest on nests. On uh, on trees, the, the the graph that you see there is basically the evolution of the birded vulture population in the Alps. Uh, so as I've said, um, the the project started in the 70s. Uh, the first birds were released uh, in uh, um, the 80s, and the first breeding in the wild started only in 1997. 10 years or 11 years in, even after the release of the same birds. So extinct in 1913, um, first breeding again in 1997. And you can see the evolution of the population there from 1997 to today, um, a, 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 a continuous increase. There are now over 50 pairs of uh, buried vultures across the Alps, in Italy, in France, in Switzerland, in Austria. Uh, and we can say that this species is back from the brink, is back uh, in, in, the, in the Alps. And this is an incredible success story. Yeah, that actually blends in with a question here from Susan North. Uh, she says, I'd asked before, due to the reproduction of the first vulture you showed that do not reproduce for 10 years, how does it affect the population size? Maybe you can just allude a bit more to that. Yes, uh, well, I mean, it's quite difficult, as I mentioned. If you release a chick today, this chick will only reproduce uh, in 10 years' time which means that we really have to make sure that this chick survives all this time. And, and also we need to, to reintroduce a sufficient number of chicks to, to then uh, uh, produce a viable population of, of pairs. This is actually um, a picture of, um, in the boxes there you see in the middle of the picture, there are some chicks that are going to be put in the nest platforms high up in the Alps. And uh, this, project, uh, this project has increased um, uh, incredible attention from local stakeholders, people, hunters, cattle breeders, tourism, uh, the, the local municipalities. So what we usually do is we organize a little ceremony down in the valley, and that's what this picture shows, where people come. Uh, the, the birds are briefly shown to them. They are usually named after somebody, uh, um, a local politician or something that baptizes them. And then a restricted group of people walk up the mountain with those boxes on rucksacks and to put these chicks uh, on special platforms from where they will fledge and, and hopefully adapt to, to the mountain life. And here comes a question that is very suitable for this from Blue24. The question is, do any of the vultures' native countries, governments, you were talking about India and you're talking about Africa also as a continent, ever do anything about uh, this to protect them? And we're seeing incredible uh, initiative here in Europe, but where? what about the countries where the vultures actually originate or were in the millions, as you mentioned before? Yes, well, um, I mean, Europe uh, is indeed the, the, the best case, uh, well, as it is, in fact, North America, where uh, we've got very good nature conservation legislation, we've got strategies, uh, we've got priorities, and where governments uh, have actually been investing quite a lot of money in the protection of those of those rare species. Uh, that has, has, has lagged behind in countries like Africa and Asia. They are now starting... Uh, to, um, uh, to to worry about their vultures. So, for example, the Asian countries have banned that veterinary drug uh, following the collapse of the vulture populations there. And, and, and there are some the first steps towards the conservation of vultures. One of the problems we have in Africa is indeed um, uh, that, you know, there are so many uh, wildlife crises in Africa, the rhino poaching, the elephant poaching, the, the killing of lions, that vultures do not get that much attention um, uh, when compared with those charismatic animals. And therefore, governments tend to pay a little bit more attention. Uh, when they pay attention, they tend to pay a little bit more attention 
attention to those issues and vultures are always in the bottom of the scale but but we've seen that they've they, they are extremely useful and necessary um, uh, and we are trying to convince uh, gov african governments uh, to, uh, to 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 dedicate some some attention uh, to uh, to them Right, and an interesting question, and then maybe you can explain the map too. Here from Margaret59, I don't think the New World vultures practice obligatory canism, do they? Question mark. No, that is indeed uh, um, uh, the case of the birded vulture, uh, which is uh, a species from from the old world. Uh, the New World vultures do not do not practice that. The the map. Uh, the map that you see is basically the story of the reintroduction of the buried vulture in Europe. Um, it was once upon a time only, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the only populations left were in the Pyrenees and then in two Mediterranean islands. And then we started to reintroduce them into the Alps, which is that uh, a purple uh, area uh, over there, the, 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 the largest uh, mountain chain in Europe. And if you probably press the button, you'll see some arrows and some... Uh, um, uh, some points. These are indeed our reintroduction sites in the Alps, in Andalusia, in some mountains between Andalusia and the Pyrenees, in some mountains between the Pyrenees and the Alps, and also in Corsica. And what we are now trying to do is we are trying to link these populations. We are choosing strategically our reintroduction sites so as to uh, link naturally these populations and create corridors for uh, the, the species to fly from one mountain chain to the other and therefore produce uh, more viable and sustainable populations at an European level. Very good. And this question again from Margaret59, Dr. Tavares. Can you comment on the percentage of success with the re released bearded vulture youngsters? Yes, very good question. So um, uh, it is quite high, and that is indeed one of the one of the the the, the secrets of our reintroduction projects. So mortality is quite uh, is quite low. It exists, but it is quite low. This means, however, that we only start a reintroduction project when we are absolutely sure that the threats that caused their extinction in the first place are not there any longer. And very often we have to work many years uh, minimizing those threats before we actually release uh, uh, animals. It would make no sense to release animals if the threats were still there and if the birds would die after one, two or three years. Uh, so we carefully choose the areas where we are introducing them uh, in order to um, uh, uh, to make sure that the survival is uh, quite high. The picture that you have there is um, another introduction project which actually has started only this year with another species of vulture in Europe called the Cinereus vulture, uh, and this is in Bulgaria. Uh, so we are introducing the species to Bulgaria. Uh, in southeastern Europe, uh, that species uh, lives only in one small colony in Greece, uh, in Dadia Forest. This is one of the species that nests on trees, and uh, um, we are introducing it to Bulgaria. If you uh, if you press the button for the next slide, um, you see uh, this summer we we released three cinereus vultures there. These are two young cinereus vultures that were captive bred in a zoo. Uh, they are almost uh, the age of fledging, but not quite. And they were put in a, an artificial platform on top of a tree that was constructed looking like a nest. And they have fledged from, um, from here uh, uh, into nature. If you notice, they have a coloring, um, but they also they have um, uh, we put them a tag a small uh, uh, satellite or GPS tag um, uh, in the animal that allows us to follow the bird um, via our mobile phones and uh, and that is very important because it tells us where the birds fly how they are reacting to the environment uh, if they die uh, where they die so that we can solve the problem. Uh, and so on. So most of the birds, bird, the vultures that are released in reintroduction projects, um, are tagged with a small tag. Um, uh, uh, this was not the case 
20 or 30 years ago because that this technology didn't exist. But these days, it's not only uh, uh, cheaper and, and, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper, but it is also, um, uh, you know, uh, very, very light and very small and getting smaller all the time. We only put tags which are only one or two percent of the weight of the animal so as not to uh, hinder the, the vulture uh, cap capacity of flight. That's very interesting, uh, Jose. Maybe a quick question then. What have you learned about the migratory behavior of, 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 of specific vultures? A great deal. Um, so uh, there are two types of vultures. Uh, again, there are the migratory vultures, vultures that do really long migrations. Those are relatively rare. But for example, there is one species, the Egyptian vulture, which breeds in, breeds in Europe and winters in Africa. And we know now exactly where do they where do they migrate through and, and, and all that. And then there are um, the, the more sedentary vultures, which is the, the, the majority of the species. Uh, which live all year round uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in an area, but which tend to disperse a little bit, particularly when they are young, uh, to look for um, areas uh, to settle and, and breed. And we know a lot precisely because of those tags that we put on, on vultures. In the picture, you've got uh, this Egyptian vulture, which is the migratory one. It's uh, um, the one that winters in Africa. This species of vulture, uh, again, has got a very peculiar uh, behavior. Um, it's a relatively small vulture, but when in Africa in the winter, it actually uh, uses tools to break ostrich eggs. Uh, you may have seen this picture uh, um, in, in, in some places. It carries stones whenever it finds an abandoned ostrich egg and then throws the stones to the egg uh, in order to um, uh, uh, break the egg and it, its contents. So again, a very peculiar and interesting behavior from this species. <laughs> That's incredible. I had no idea because I've I've held an ostrich. I've, I've, those of you who've ever held hold an, held an ostrich eggs, it's at least I think one or even more or a dozen eggs. That's the equivalent. It's huge and it is rock solid. So I'm surprised they could actually crack them with rocks. You know, that's yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question. That was a good one here from from Cassie um, uh, Scott that uh, refers actually to the to 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 the um, yeah, the previous eagles bones. Yeah, is that why his head is feathered? You were talking about um, certain uh, vultures that have uh, that that have bowl, uh, are bald because of the way they they eat, and and then the other ones obviously going for bones. Uh, is that why why uh, it's feathered? Indeed. So because it really does not uh, eat from the inside of that uh, of that bodies. Uh, it does not need to have a bold neck, and therefore its its neck and head are feathered. Uh, you you probably have noticed in the pictures that they've got this beautiful orange tinge to 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 their feathers, to their breast feathers, and this is because um, uh, this is uh, um, uh, yeah you, you've got it there in the neck, for example. You can see it there in the in the middle one. This is a, actually a, a result of uh, mud baths. They they actually like. We don't know yet why they do this. If it is to clean their their feathers of parasites. If it has got some visual communication um, uh, um, objective. But they 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 try to find um, uh, iron uh, mud. So uh, areas in the mountains where there's actually a little bit of iron water or. Uh, you know, iron soil, uh, which is by nature red, and they then, um, uh, uh, you know, they 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 basically uh, bath themselves in that soil and in that mud, and they um, and they, they 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 become with with that orangish reddish color. In captivity, if you don't give them uh, uh, any such soil, they are pure white below. But once you give them a little bit of of this, uh, you know, iron soil, they they bath in it and they um, uh, happily and and they keep that color in captivity as well. Yeah, and I was actually waiting for a question like here. Here we go. Uh, this is Wobby's asking Dr. Tavares. You must be familiar with the Andean condor. Can you comment on it? The biggest vulture, of course. 
Yes, Andean condor. So it's, um, I mean, uh, it's a New World vulture. It's the family of the Californian condor. There's actually um, more than one species. There's the king condor, uh, there's the Andean condor, and that's the uh, Californian condor. The Andean condor is the, the, the condor of, of, of the, and the uh, Andes mountains in South America. Unfortunately, it's also declining very fast uh, for the same reasons uh, that many other vultures in Africa and in Asia disappeared, uh, mostly uh, poisoning. Poison is the main threat to vultures. Um, uh, so usually poison uh, is, well, first of all, it's an illegal activity, the poisoning of wildlife. Poison is not directed at vultures. Poison is directed at predators. So in Africa to kill lions, in Europe to kill wolves, in North America to kill bears or coyotes uh, or wolves, in South America to, to kill pumas or, or mountain foxes. So farmers, that, uh, farmers or hunters that uh, do not want predators to kill their game or predators to kill their stock, uh, very often put um, in a dead carcass a very powerful substance. This is illegal. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, vultures do not know that. They come down, they eat the carcass, and uh, they uh, they die. And unfortunately, in, Ar in Argentina in particular, but in some other countries in South America, Andean condors have also been uh, suffering. Well, that's incredible. So let's go through the rest of your presentation. You must be so tired. I'm sorry. It's four, six past four a.m. So I feel really bad. You know, how are you doing? <laughs> that's okay. That's fine. I'm I'm okay. That's You're fine. okay. So You're fantastic. Really. I mean, we're so enjoying this. There's so there's so many comments going on everywhere. So it's uh, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, there's. I can see some some uh, comments here. By the way, also thank you on 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 Periscope. Lots of great comments coming in some from Disney World and so on what they're doing for animals and so on so very very nice to see okay yeah so, i mean this is a, the egyptian vulture we also dealing with captive breeding you can you can press the the next slide um, um, we are involved also in lots of conservation projects this for example is an image of a river canyon um, in between Portugal and Spain, um, typical vulture country, you've got the cliff faces where vultures breed, um, uh, and we are involved with in conservation projects with lots of other organizations trying to protect them, uh, not only ca doing captive breeding and reintroducing, but also protecting where they still live. And you can, you can continue. Well, these are our, our strategic priorities. I think um, um, I will focus a little bit on the fourth, um, which is uh, um, attitudes of vultures. I mean, as you've said in the beginning, um, sometimes vultures have got a bad press. Um, people usually don't like vultures. Um, vultures are, um, you know, sometimes associated with a, a negative image. You know, people sometimes call the finance people or uh, politicians, we do not like vultures. Um, some people say that vultures are, are ugly. I, I beg to, to, to disagree. Uh, but I think one of our uh, w one of our aims is to actually change this perception that vultures are ugly, stupid, uh, or uh, useless. Vultures perform a unique role in nature. They are nature's cleaning crew, uh, and therefore we dedicate quite a lot of time to communicate about vultures and try to change that perception. And um, so, if you go to our website. And you find almost every day uh, stories about uh, vultures, uh, mostly in Europe, but not only. We also uh, um, have got uh, stories about vultures in the New World. And you can follow uh, news about our projects and about the different species. So, um, uh, yeah, very, very, very important uh, role. This slide just shows some of the some of the, 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 the projects that we are involved in Europe in different countries, France, Portugal, Spain, Bulgaria, Italy, many of them funded uh, by the European Union, um, which indeed has got dedicated budget lines to fund nature conservation, uh, very much like uh, there are budget lines in the US and in Canada dedicated to fund nature conservation in, uh, in, in, those, um, in those countries. 
Yeah, I'm going to throw in a question here from Maxine Wirth, by the way. Thank you uh, to Maxine Wirth, uh, Carrie Miller and Osprey Mama for donating. We always appreciate that. Keeps the channel going. Thank you so much. So here's Maxine Wirth's question. In general, how big are the vulture eggs? I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's thinking, for example, of, of eagle eggs. Are they bigger than the normal human hand? Um, I would say that the, um, the, the bigger species, the eggs are of the size of a, um, a, a human hand. The smaller species, they are probably um, smaller, but still bigger than, than chicken, uh, chicken eggs. Right, and I have to think about what you just said. I mean, next time someone calls you calls one a vulture, we should actually be happy because if someone would call you a bald eagle or beautiful, uh, as they say, American eagle, you'd feel very proud. But they're all scavengers, right? So they're doing the similar job, just in different stages. <laughs> Absolutely, but there are beautiful stories about about vultures too. Um, you know, course. vultures in 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 Egypt, they were um, uh, they were uh, revered as gods. In fact, the Egyptian vulture, hence the name appears in the, the, the hieroglyphs in the pyramids. It represents uh, one goddess, the goddess of fertility. Uh, and, and, uh, um, there are lots of folklore associated with some vulture species in Europe. Um, the Egyptian vulture, for example, in the Balkans, is known as the shepherd's cuckoo because as it is migratory, it appears uh, with the cuckoos in spring, and the first people that see them are usually the shepherds because they've got the sheep, um, and, and the vultures are often associated with uh, um, uh, uh, livestock raising simply because there are dead animals usually uh, uh, associated with livestock raising. So beautiful stories, um, and not only the, 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 the negative ones, uh, about about that, the, the the picture that you have got in 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 the slide is actually um, a document that we've prepared for the United Nations for a convention called the Convention for Migratory Species. Uh, it's ba basically a global plan for the conservation of uh, 15 old world vultures, and it it was an incredible piece of work. Uh, this this document covers 15 species, 128 countries, um, and it was uh, partly coordinated by us, um, uh, and it precisely provides a global plan for the conservation of old world vultures, and is, we hope, an important document that governments and conservation organizations uh, can use and are using to improve the conservation of vultures worldwide. Yes, go uh, on. Pretty the good. next slide <laughs> is is a, is again an example of one of the projects. Poison is a very lar a big problem, including in Europe. So, for example, we are currently working with five organizations in the Balkans in a large scale project called the Balkan Anti Poisoning Project. Uh, this covers countries like Croatia, Macedonia, Albania, Greece, Serbia, um, uh, Bulgaria. Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina, where we are working with the police, we are working with conservation organizations, we are working with toxicological labs to improve the capacities to fight this poison uh, in the region so that vulture populations can uh, increase there. You know, I'm I'm so amazed, and I can see comments coming in from everywhere. Uh, you are a brilliant teacher, uh, educator, and obviously uh, um, an exemplary con conservationist. How do you actually get funded? Well, yes, that's that's uh, that's a very good question, and that's um, uh, one that I have to say. Uh, uh, the answer to that is a huge challenge, and that's uh, that, that's basically what I do. I, I need to 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 to, to find uh, uh, money. We basically get funded from uh, the European Union or sometimes some national governments through projects. Um, uh, we also get funded through donations. Uh, and in fact, if you go to our website, uh, you can also donate to our organization through our website. There is a button uh, uh, in, right in the beginning, in the, in, the, in, in the front of our web page, donate. Um, and you can, through PayPal, um, uh, uh, there exactly on the right hand side, through PayPal, you can you can donate to um, to us. Uh, it's it's challenging because year after year we need to secure the funds that allow 
uh, for us to continue to um, uh, to work. Um, but yeah, we develop projects, we submit and submit projects to 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 budget lines that uh, um, are in, in, in you know uh, fund projects in this area, and and we try to engage with people and convince them that uh, you know if they could donate 20, 30, 40 euros or dollars uh, every year to us, that is a huge help and goes towards the conservation of vultures. So quite a lot of our work relates to the slide that you were just showing, um, uh, which is uh, disseminating um, uh, the our work, the information about our work and the importance of vultures uh, worldwide. We organize many events in zoos, uh, talks and so on, where we talk about our work, our uh, vultures, and hopefully convince people to... Um, uh, well, to, to 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 change their attitudes to vultures uh, and uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, help lobby, lobby governments towards vulture conservation um, and eventually donate some money to us. And here's a beautiful movie. I won't run it now, but maybe it's something for for people to look at. By the way, um, just coming to the donation, so that the uh, website uh, Nicole has put below uh, the YouTube. Um, uh, in in the text be, be below the link of the YouTube, uh, which which uh, which this um, live stream is about. So it's www.fourvultures.org, and four with a with a number four. So it's number four vultures.org, and you'll find information there on the um, on on the donation. And there seems to be a movie here. Can you just comment on that? It, it, it won't load for some reason, but. Um, what what is this movie about? <laughs> yes, well, this movie was actually about a crowdfunding campaign that we. Uh, it's it's not loading simply because uh, this movie was about the crowdfunding campaign that finished very recently. Uh, we do have got other movies in our website uh, about our work that you can see. This one was about uh, birded vultures on the move. Um, for captive breeding, we very often have to um, uh, uh, move birded vultures across zoos. Um, um, you know, sometimes um, pairs do not breed well, um, like humans, you know, uh, people don't fit uh, together, birded vultures might not fit together as a couple, and we need to change them and try other, you know, other other uh, couplings, and, and, uh, and therefore we very often need to move birds across zoos, this costs money, so this... Um, uh, this uh, all, um, autumn, we actually were asking people to donate to us so that we could move 19 birds across zoos in Europe to maximize um, uh, the, the breeding potential and therefore the number of birds to be released. Uh, we needed about 7,500 euros, which is uh, about $8,000. And fortunately, we managed to get that money from donations from uh, individuals and that movie was the movie that supported this um, this campaign well i think that's that's really very interesting you know um, raising funds is a lot of work and i i'm sure you have to use a lot of creativity to to um you know to achieve that if there's anything i can do to help let me know i'm always happy i've got a lot of wildlife pictures if that helps you in any way let me know okay so i just wanted to <laughs> mention thank that. you well you, you are you are already helping by by inviting us to be to be on your program well it's an absolute honor to, and really it's a, a it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here i'm 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 very honored and humbled by your incredible knowledge that you're giving us. It's uh, it's incredible. So let's see. I don't think there are any more questions. You know, usually what I do, Jose, is um, I ask the uh, the you know the guest. Uh, of course, this is you in this case to ask a question and then have people dialing in. But I'm very concerned about the time because it's twenty past four right now for you. So I think this is rather cruel to do. <laughs> so I don't know. So I think maybe. Uh, you know, let's let's uh, may, maybe not do that now because it takes away another twenty minutes uh, of, of of your sleep. And I know you're incredibly busy. I do want to thank you, uh, you know, a lot for 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 being here on the show. It's been absolutely incredible. Also, Nicole, again, happy birthday to you, and and thanks so much for getting uh, such an incredible guest here. So it's been a great honor. I I, I can see lots of comments. Um, I'm just going to put you again on the screen so people can. You know, can see you properly there, and uh, you know, thank you so much for being there. 
so <laughs> thank you, thank you. I I thank you, um, and I I join. I, I invite everybody to check our website um, and uh, uh, to uh, well to to join this movement as we have in our logo all together for vultures. Uh, I hope that this has been informative uh, and and positive for you all. Well, thank you so much. And uh, the thanks for coming in all channels here. Also, I can see Sapphire Song Kit on... on um, I'm going to give a bit of credit here to, to, to Periscope too, so you know you're not forgotten. And there they, they, they are a lot of good comments here. So it's very nice. So do look again on the on the link. It's www.4vultures.org and you'll find everything there. So thank you very much, Jose, for being with us. Just stay on for two minutes, if you can, can bear it. I'll just say goodbye to everyone, and then uh, you know, and, 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 and then we'll talk for two minutes, and, and, and then I'll let you go finally to bed, okay? Thank so, you. So thanks so much. Okay, so you can see Minister the Anders, the, the, the view from the back here. You can see the studio and so on, all the, you know, all the preparation that goes on, the different channels, for those of you who haven't seen, seen this type of view. Anyway, uh, I wanted to thank you very much for, for, for taking part in this. It's an absolute pleasure. I, uh, you know, together with, with uh, the incredible people uh, that I have, I've got Sasha, uh, Susie, and also Jenny here, and I've got Kevin helping me on the phones, although there were no phone calls tonight. I hope you understand that. But do join us next week again. I think in two weeks' time, we're going to have Kit and Jamie here. I, I think Jamie, in two weeks, is going to talk, uh, if possible, about the Reading Fire. He's a firefighter uh, that's been in this incredible... Um, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the incredible de devastating fires that we've had in Reading. So uh, it's very likely I will have him in two weeks here live in the studio uh, sh talking about this and also the effects that he's experienced that are so unique. I think it's going to be an absolute honor to have him. So next week we're going to have another guest. I don't know who the guest is again, but I wanted to thank uh, thank the team. I'll just switch over one uh, very quickly here. So there we are. Yes. So thank you very much for participating. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. I'm going to first switch off YouTube. So have a have a wonderful weekend and thank you again to Jose uh, for 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 participating and and thank you for everyone for all your great questions and for the dedications and and all the uh, all the donations and also think please of of, of Jose. Uh, in future. Okay, I've, I think I've got Jose in the background again. I shouldn't. Have. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think he's had enough. <laughs> I'll put the nice bird pictures now in the back. Okay, so so uh, uh, thanks. Okay, let's.